The idea behind participatory budgeting, a core idea is that it's a democratic policy making process in which incremental decisions are made and, decision, and citizens make binding votes that result in government action. It's a very straightforward process, but cities can experiment with different ways of implementing these programs, right? There is not a set formula, but it comes down to what are the goals that a community wants to achieve. And so you can think about, sort of the first step is a brainstorming of ideas. People bring in ideas, people listen to each other, you begin to have this exchange and this deliberation about what's important. There's this process of developing proposals. People come in with ideas, they may be sort of not fully developed, so then you begin to sort of refine the process to figure out what's legal and what's possible. The vote is the third step um, that's crucial, and there's different voting mechanisms that are used. That's something we can talk about over the course of the day, whether you vote by a show of hands, whether you vote in a secret ballot, whether you do consensus decision making. There's a whole different uh, set of means that you can use. And then finally, there's this process of implementation of the winning process. And that's sort of where you begin to have this co-governance, the relationship between citizens um, and the government, and government where they are working together to try to uh, implement these projects. The first case in, uh, uh, in the southern part of Brazil was started in the context of a democratic renewal. Brazil had a dictatorship from 1964 to 1985, and there was a lot of effort to try to think about how can we move beyond the confines of representative democracy? What can we do differently? And the idea was that we want to sort of sustain the mobilization of people. We want to get people involved in government, but we also want to do this within the context of having an election, a regular election cycle. Elections were identified as being important, as, as we know, but then there was a recognition that People, that just governments make decisions throughout the year. And so it was an effort to try to get people more involved in that process. The first year in this city, uh, the city's about 1.3 million, there were um, 1,000 people. Very low, I mean, sort of 1.3 million, 1,000 people making decisions wasn't that high. But what happened is the government followed through. The decisions that were made in those forums then resulted in uh, those communities receiving those projects. And in a couple of years, you had around 30,000 people a year participating in the process. And then in other cities in Brazil, you had something similar. So you sort of get this really robust growth where at one point they were deciding about 100 million US dollars. Now, it started in one case, but we've identified at least 3,000 municipalities and cities across the world that have adopted this sort of program. There are a set of principles that we've identified that really unite and link the participatory budgeting programs that exist across the world. The way that this is being now, talked about and being used in, more, in wealthier, more established democracy like the United States is a renewal. There's a sense today that both in Europe and the United States that democratic institutions are not working well. How can we renew the type of institutions, the ways that people engage? So you encourage resident, resident mobilization with a real uh, emphasis on um, social inclusion. So it's social inclusions of non-traditional actors, okay? So trying to figure out what are the groups that, are, that don't vote, what are the groups that generally don't have voice? Those are the groups that a lot of participatory budgeting programs have targeted because oftentimes wealthier, upper income individuals have access to city council members, they have access to lobbying groups. So this is a way to try to figure out how can we reach out to those groups that really don't have a voice in the political system. Another part of the participatory budgeting is there's been a real emphasis on trying to incorporate social justice. And in terms of social justice, it's trying to think about how we spend resources that go to those communities that are underserved. The process is also designed to promote deliberation. Okay, so deliberation um, occurs in which citizens begin to uh, exchange ideas about where and how the, the problems that they face. It's an exchange of information between citizens as well as between citizens and government officials. So it's a multi-level uh, deliberative forum where you're beginning to sort of think about, here's what really matters to us. Here are the issues that are not being addressed. The fourth principle that's really important is this binding decision making. 
Okay, and that's, I've mentioned that at the beginning, and I want to sort of come back to this. Governments are delegating authority to citizens. Now, this is done within parameters, right? Governments say, okay, you have $500,000. Here's what you can legally do. So you set up the parameters of what is possible, but then when, when citizens make those decisions, it goes through, and that is a really, really important shift for how citizen participation occurs in the context of in a lot of these democracies. The last principle that's really important is that these processes institutionalize transparency. So you know how much money is, is available, you know then who is being contracted, you know um, that, that citizens and government officials who are monitoring these have a real sense of how the resources are being spent. The idea then is that this, the, that, the, that this occurs within the participatory budgeting process, but the hope is that there is a spillover effect. And the spillover effect becomes where the, the people learn about how the process works so that they can use that information in other arenas. Large margins. So the first reason we can think about that, polit that governments like to do this, is, especially elected officials, is we see positive effects in terms of mobilizing new types of residents. We see that new that there that people who don't traditionally vote are then more likely to be engaged in the process. Another reason that governments like to do this is it helps to generate learning about the constraints that are on them, right? So as we know, many people in this room are likely aware governments have far less resources than they would like. They have a whole series of demands that are much greater, but oftentimes citizens don't really understand this, right? That there's this disconnect between sort of um, knowledge about what government can do. Um, and so the participatory budgeting process is a, helps to create this education among citizens, among residents, among participants, which really helps to, um, to, to create a, a better quality debate around what is possible. Okay. So in terms of participants and, and people who engage, why do, why do they want to be involved in this? And I think there's really sort of two sets of core motivations. The one motivation is that when people are sort of, some people want to be involved because they're trying to do something that's bigger than themselves. They want to be involved because they're trying to help their community, they're trying to help their sort of build democracy or renew democracy. But I think it's also a crucial reason is that people are trying to secure specific projects that help their communities. Um, and that's what I think participatory budgeting, that's one of the reasons it's sweeping across the world, and it's, it's sort of in many places, is it's the, the program rules and the principles capture these dual self-interest and community building in ways that very few other programs have been able to do successfully. And so that really generates a lot of support. We sort of see that participatory budgeting has this process of, ex uh, of extending and expanding voice and vote to citizens. So what we see, the, the, the reason that people become engaged and continue to participate is they think their time is valued and it matters. And this is a process where you can actually sort of see, was my voice heard? Is there a connection between my time and government outcomes? So cities that adopted it had a, about a 20% growth in civil society organizations. So in fact, it is creating new types of organizations. You have new actors who are involved in the process. So there's this real sense that this is a way to create community. The second area that we found is that cities that adopt this spend higher resources on healthcare and sanitation. We think that's because they're bringing these low-income, poor residents into public forums where they begin to say, well, what we really need is we need basic health care. We need basic sanitation. And it creates this dialogue. The participatory budgeting programs themselves didn't allocate that much more resources to health care sanitation, but it created this broader context in which you begin to have an emphasis um, on those areas. Finally, we also find that those cities that adopt it collect higher property taxes and sales tax. Impact is much stronger when you have key government actors who are champions. So this is an elected official or a 
sort of higher ranking civil servant who says, we want to invest our resources and our energy into this. When that occurs, you're more likely to get uh, greater support within the bureaucracies, greater support among community members to actually be able to implement some of these programs. 